Today we're going to talk about chapter 50, which is the first trimester complications. Um, so we're starting off our second semester um, with this. So you'll have to kind of remember back some of your first trimester stuff that you learned last in November um, to kind of correlate with this chapter. So first trimester bleeding. Um, so the first trimester, if you remember, uh, it contains the weeks of, from conception to 13 weeks, six days, and that's considered the first trimester. So if um, a patient has bleeding within those weeks of gestation, it's considered first trimester bleeding. And this is a, the most um, com common time that a patient would have bleeding would be in the first trimester. Some of that could be due to implantation. Some of that could be due to miscarriage. Um, but about 15% of clinically recognized pregnancies spontaneously miscarry. So it is kind of a high chance um, in the first trimester that a patient would miscarry. Some of these occur um, as chemical pregnancies where there's not really, a patient gets a positive pregnancy test, but yet um, then spontaneously starts the period about a week later. Um, so the gestational sac fetal pole has not been established within the uterus. Other times a patient could have already had a viable pregnancy. Um, and, you know, we got fetal heart tones and we got um, a good measurement and the baby was looking good. And then two weeks later, the patient starts bleeding and we go to scan her again and there's no fetal heart tones and um, she's starting to have a miscarriage. So it, it kind of can be all over the board. Sometimes even a patient could just have what we call a subchorionic hemorrhage from implantation and be bleeding and the baby still be viable. Um, but first trimester bleeding is one of the most common reasons why you would scan a first trimester um, fetus. Most common presentation for complications is vaginal bleeding or frank bleeding occurring in nearly 25% of patients during early stage of pregnancy. So one in four patients do have some type of bleeding within their first trimester. If bleeding is accompanied by severe pain, uterine contractions, dilated cervix, pregnancy is unlikely to progress. A lot of patients that are having a lot of clotting, um, that's usually a sign to me that the patient's probably having a miscarriage. Um, but the patients do benefit from early transvaginal examinations to carefully examine the uterine cavity to investigate presence of embryo, fetal heartbeat, yolk sac, and retain products. So you will, especially if you work in the hospital or you work at an OBGYN clinic, um, you will be doing a lot of first trimester scans. Um, so it's something that you will want to know what you're looking at and how to properly diagnose what you see. So the first thing we're going to talk about is subchorionic hemorrhage. And I feel like just from my personal experience of doing this for many, many years, um, I see a lot of subchorionic hemorrhages where a patient comes in, they're having some just uh, red bleeding, um, no pain, no clotting, just red bleeding, but it is very scary for them, of course. Um, so they call their doctor and the doctor usually is like, okay, why don't you go let's go ahead and get you in for an ultrasound. Um, and this seems to be a pretty common scenario that happens. Um, it is the most common occurrence of bleeding in the first trimester and the low pressure bleeds and result from process of implantation of the fertilized ovum into the endometrial cavity and myometrial wall. So sometimes when the ovum is implanting, a patient will just get some bleeding. If a patient hemorrhages though, this is um, like a bleed between the myometrium and the margins of the gestational sac. And it usually occurs, you know, pretty, pretty often, I would say one in 10, two in 10 pregnancies have a subchorionic hemorrhage. Um, but it kind of depends on the prognosis, how big or small it is. The smaller it is, the better prognosis, the larger it is, the worse the prognosis kind of thing. Um, 
a lot of people also just real quick, implantation bleeding is really a real thing. So some patients will think that they have started their period because implantation bleeding usually occurs about when you would miss your period. So a patient would have um, a little bit of bleeding, not a full on period, but they would have bleeding and um, think that that was their period. They just had a light period that month. Um, what they didn't know is that that was a baby implanting into their uterus. Um, so that also, you see that sometimes where a patient does starts feeling pretty gross and sick around six to seven weeks of pregnancy. She's like, they're like, what's going on? She goes to the doctor. She's like, I think I have the flu. I just don't feel good. Comes back, positive pregnancy test. Um, and they're like, well, I just had a period, but it was implantation bleeding. So uh, finding can help distinguish subchorionic hemorrhage from a repto placenta, which generally occurs, occurs in the second trimester and may be present as a lucency posterior placenta. So let's not worry about that right now, but there can be something called a placental abruption that occurs second, third trimester. Um, subchorionic hemorrhages occur more in the first trimester. Um, placenta abruptions, which are very serious thing, um, occur more in the second and third trimester. So with um, clinical findings for a subchorionic hemorrhage, most of the time I would say just some bleeding or spotting. Sometimes patients will have a little bit of uterine cramping, but I would say more of the time they just have um, painless bleeding. Uh, although if a hemorrhage does get large enough, it can lead to spontaneous abortion. So we do want to watch the hemorrhage to see how large it gets. So the early bleed, when a patient just starts bleeding or the hemorrhage just occurs, it's gonna be slightly echogenic as red blood cells actively fill the area. With time, the hemorrhage becomes anechoic and may be seen between the uterine wall and the fetal membrane. It kind of looks like a crescent, I feel like, um, and I'll show you some pictures in just a second. Patients may present with active vaginal bleeding, subchorionic bleed, easily seen by ultrasounds, and they are pretty easy. I just you need to know what you're looking at to be able to diagnose them. So here's the uterus here. This is a transvaginal ultrasound. This is the gestational sac. This is the fetal pole. This black right here, this is the um, gestational cavity. Now this is all good. So then we look over here and we see this black anechoic area here. This should not be here. This is the subchorionic hemorrhage. So this is what we need to um, concentrate on. Here is another picture of a subchorionic hemorrhage. And um, this is the uterus. This is the gestational sac. You see the black anechoic of the gestational sac. But then next to it, you see almost like a hypochoic area. Now this would be a early bleed. If you remember from what I just had said that um, when they're just start bleeding, they have it's more of a hy hyperechoic hypochoic um, looking area, and that's because of the red blood cells. So this is um, a pretty early bleed. This is a very large bleed. Um, this was probably going to have a higher chance of spontaneous abortion just from the fact of looking at how large this bleed is compared to the gestational sac. All right, so let's talk about the intrauterine sac. If a patient presents with a positive pregnancy test, the uterus appears normal and the endometrial complex shows no sign of gestational sac, we gotta talk about our differential diagnosis. So it could be that the patient is just not far enough long. The patient could um, be kind of off on their dates and think that they had a period like two weeks before. No, I really swear I should be six weeks, but they end up being only four weeks gestation. At four weeks gestation, we're not going to see a gestational sac yet. So that would be one of your differential diagnoses. The second one is a non-developing pregnancy. So this could be like the pregnancy is just not developing correctly. And the third thing would be a possible ectopic pregnancy. So the characteristics for a sonographic diagnosis of absent intrauterine sac consists of the empty uterus with no evidence of endometrial fluid connection, um, absence of annexal masses or free fluid, and positive beta-HCG. 
So the sac grows approximately one millimeter a day in the first trimester, and the yolk sac should be visualized transvaginally when gestational sac reaches eight millimeters. So um, these are things that you probably want to know for your test. The one millimeter a day gestational sac should be eight millimeters when you see a yolk sac. Uh, the embryo should be visualized when a mean sac diameter is greater than 16 millimeters. And the normal embryo grows at about one millimeter a day, just like the sac. And especially, you need to know this, the cardiac activity is visible by five and a half to six and a half weeks. Now, I have a personal example of this that um, with my last pregnancy, I knew I was pregnant really pretty early, about four weeks. And so when I scanned myself, um, all I saw was just a really thick in endometrium. Um, but I didn't see a gestational sac until about five weeks. And so I was kind of on that, is everything gonna develop okay? Is there something wrong? Um, but really you don't see a little gestational sac until about five weeks gestation. So about a week after your missed mis period. So if for some reason, let's say that the pregnancy is not developing correctly and it just is like a chemical pregnancy, some kind of chromosomal abnormality that happens all the time. Um, just things, implantation didn't occur, just things that do happen. The serial HCG levels, the blood levels are gonna dem demonstrate success, excessive decline. But caution should be taken when positive pregnancy tests in an empty uterus to see. So the possibility that this was just a normal early intrauterine pregnancy between five, three and five weeks could be possible. So if let's say a patient comes in and I just see a thickened endometrium, patient unsure of dates. Um, I look at the ovaries, I don't see any adnexal masses, but the patient has a positive pregnancy tail test and the HCG levels are on the fence of where they would be when you saw something in the gestational sac. What usually happens, I would tell the doctor and the doctor would set up another ultrasound within a week because within a week with all the, how much everything grows, um, we should be able to see a gestational sac, a yolk sac or fetal pulp. So they'll um, correlate the HCG levels from the blood with the ultrasound to make sure everything is developing correctly. If an endometrium is abnormally thick or a regular echogenic differential diagnosis could be like intrauterine blood, retain product conception, decidual reaction with ectopic pregnancy, or decidual changes resulting from early but not yet visible intrauterine pregnancy. So there could be a lot of things going on. Um, so a lot of people that are kind of in this four to six week gestation, if they've had an ultrasound, if they're having bleeding or... Um, just found out they're pregnant and they came in for ultrasound um, they're not going to get many answers because it's kind of just you're on the fence um, until about six weeks when we start really seeing stuff. So this is an early gestation. So this is the uterus transvaginally and you can see this very echogenic, very thick endometrium. That's about four weeks. So this is right when the patient would miss their period. That's what it looks like. So an incomplete spontaneous abortion may show several sonographic findings ranging from intact gestational sac with non-viable embryo to collapsed gestational sac grossly misshapen. So a lot of the times, let's say a patient is having bleeding and they come in here and you see this kind of sac. The irregular sac like this is not a good sign. Usually that means that the patient will start having a miscarriage soon or um, is having a miscarriage. Um, a lot of the times the fetal pull, there is no heart rate at this time and a possible yolk sac is seen, um, but seeing a regular gestational sac is not good for viability. So when a patient's having spontaneous abortion, a lot, sometimes you will scan a patient who is just really bleeding and clotting. Um, and they might still have retained products, which means they haven't like 
gotten everything out. The uterus hasn't contracted everything out. Um, so when that happens, you might still see a thickened endometrium, um, increased vascularity of the endometrium, and then um, color Doppler will help you with that. A lot of the times these patients will continually bleed and the uterus will do everything by itself. But sometimes um, a patient doesn't get all of the retained products out and the doctor has to go in and do what is called a, a DNC to remove the rest of the um, retained products of conception. So when, definitely when we see um, some of the embryonic parts, a gestational sac, embryonic discs, those are uh, retained products. Um, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish this um, between blood clots. And the quantitative HCG level that do not decline normally, thicken endometrium, increased vascular flow will discriminate evidence for retained products. So the HCG level, when they do have retained products, is not going to go decrease as fast as if a patient um, just spontaneously spontaneously aborts and every, um, all the contents is shedded out. Now, when we say quantitative, that means there's a number to it, which would mean um, a blood test. Qualitative HCG would be like, if you took a pregnancy test, it's yes, it's positive or negative, but we don't know how much HCG a patient has until we do a quantitative test. So when there's any kind of bleeding, any kind of suspicion for ectopic pregnancy, um, they like to do the blood tests. This is another picture of a spontaneous abortion um, in the making. Um, so this is gestational sac, and uh, you can see it's irregular. This is another one. Um, where you can see some of the gestational sac almost hitting the cervix here. Um, and that means that it's an impending abortion basically. And here's another one. It just is not a normal thing. There might be some clot within the gestational sac now. So a gestational sac without an embryo or yolk sac. Okay, so we see a black hole but we don't see an embryo and we don't see a yolk sac yet. So what could this be? Um, a normally, normal early IUP, so maybe about five, exactly five weeks, we haven't seen anything else. It could be another abnormal intrauterine pregnancy or it could be a pseudo gestational sac in a patient with ectopic pregnancy. So those are your three conditions. So with a normal IUP, you're gonna get that thickened in endometrium first. And then you're gonna start seeing a little itty bitty gestational sac. And at abnormal intrauterine pregnancy, you could get just a empty sac. And we call this a blighted ovum or an embryonic pregnancy. Sometimes you're gonna see just a little itty bitty sac and the patient's supposed to be six weeks. When I see a little small sac and the patient's about six, seven weeks, pretty good on their dates, I really start being suspicious of an atopic pregnancy. At this point, I am looking very, very closely at the adnexal areas. So what's the criteria for an abnormal sac? And the gestational sac should be imaged consistently by both transadominal and transvaginal sonography when it's about when its mean diameter is five millimeters, and this corresponds to about four to five weeks gestation. I would say closer to five weeks is when you should see a gestational sac. So, so sequential scanning can document appropriate interval growth of one millimeter a day, and lack of appropriate growth indicates abnormal sac. Now, when you're a crazy sonographer and you're pregnant, and um, you can't judge anybody because you're all crazy, because um, you want to make sure everything's okay and you have the imaging to do so. So yes, I have to say that I did scan Isla's gestational sac for many, many days in a row to make sure that it was growing um, correctly. And I can say, because I was teaching at the time too, that um, it does 
um, grow about one millimeter a day. So I did that for a while and then I thought I should probably stop once I saw a uh, fetal pull in a heart rate. <laughs> but um, when you have the tools, you just kind of got to do it. Okay, there's here are some really um, important things for you guys. So the criteria for abnormal sac, transvaginally sonography is ideal to image early gestational sac. When a gestational sac measures eight millimeters or greater, a definitive yolk sac should be demonstrated. So the yolk sac may grow 0.1 mm of the MSD, which is the mean sac diameter, to 15 millimeters. And when the gestational sac measures 25 millimeters, an embryo with cardiac activity must be seen. Now I would say that the last one is the most important one for you guys to know. So when you do a gestational sac measurement, so from one end to the other end, and you don't see an embryo, it's probably going to be an embryonic pregnancy or applied at open. So let's talk about that. Um, it's a blighted ovum or an embryonic pregnancy. Now they like to use the term an embryonic pregnancy more. It's a gestational sac in which embryo fails to develop or stops developing at such an early stage that is imperceptible by ultrasound. So trophoblastic tissue may continue to prol proliferate and despite failed embryonic growth. So gestational sac will continue to grow and the quantitative HCG levels may continue to rise, but not at a rapid rate. So a patient who thinks everything's going good, no miscarriage, no bleeding, still having symptoms of pregnancy, comes in around like 10 weeks and you don't see a fetus. And that happens more than you would like it to happen. But um, the bummer thing is, is that um, a patient does think that they don't know that anything is wrong because most of the time bleeding is not associated with this. Typical sonographic appearance of an embryonic pregnancy is a large empty gestational sac. It does not demonstrate yolk sac, amnion, or embryon, embryo. And that's pretty much what it looks like. So in subsequent repeat studies of evaluate the growth size of the sac, presence of yolk sac, development of embryo, and presence of absence of cardiac activity. Now, if um, there is a gestational sac that is kind of on the line, like, well, it could just be a large early gestational sac, they will want to repeat the ultrasound in one to two weeks to see if anything has developed, like a yolk sac or embryo. Sonographic findings of gestational sacs associated with abnormal intrauterine pregnancies. Okay, so the absence of a cardiac motion in embryos five millimeters or larger, or absence of cardiac motion after six and a half weeks. So if you see an embryo, but you do not see cardiac activity with these two criteria, then it's a fetal demise. For the yolk sac, a large yolk sac or amnion without a visible embryo happens sometimes, or a calcified yolk sac. I see a larger yolk sac more. Um, and usually this means things just didn't, didn't develop correctly, or there was some kind of chromosomal abnormality, which seems to happen a lot. Large gestational sac um, greater than eight to millimeters lacking viable embryo or greater than eight millimeters lacking visible yolk sac are your two criteria for um, an embryonic pregnancies. And the shape, if it's irregular misshapen, that's abnormal. If it's low, if it's corneal, or if it's hourglassing through the cervical os, those are all very, very abnormal. Trophoblastic reaction. Um, if it's now, you remember the dub, double decidual reaction that I talked to you guys about in the first trimester where there's an echogenic ring around the gestational sac, and that's considered normal. And um, if you don't see that, um, if it's irregular, 
if it's thin, if there's venous flow within it, it's not normal. If the gestational sac is not growing, or if it's very small, if there's no embryonic growth, if there's a discrepancy between the size, sac size and HCG levels. So let's talk a little bit about gestational trophoblastic disease and its proliferative disease of the trophoblast after abnormal conception. And it represents a spectrum of diseases from relative benign form, a dadiform mole, or a more malignant form or invasive mole or choriocarcinoma. So the clinical hallmark of gestational trophoblastic disease is vaginal bleeding in the first or early second trimester. Um, with a molar pregnancy, um, the serum levels of beta HCG are dramatically elevated, about 100,000 ml. So they're very, very high, more highly elevated than they should be. Um, a patient may also experience symptoms of hyperemesis and preeclampsia. And the maternal serum alpha fetal protein will be notably low in pregnancies complicated by it. Um, had data from mole. Fetal parts may develop concurrent with abnormal trophoblastic tissue. And genetic studies indicate that complete high data form moles have a normal diploid karyotype of 46XX, um, usually entirely derived from the father. So what happens with complete moles that occur are when the egg without nucleus fertilized by one normal sperm and the trophoblastic trophoblastic tissue proliferates, but no fetal parts ever develop. So then you get just trophoblastic tissue. And um, if you have a fetus that is involved with a partial mole, and um, those babies usually have triplody, which is three sets of chromosomes, and they do not usually make it through the first trimester. So the sonographic findings vary with gestational age, but I would say um, the characteristic snowstorm or um, cystically, like cystic, like a cluster of grapes appearance of the head, data for molar is more just um, the telltale signs that something like that's going on. So a patient comes in and they're eight weeks gestation, they're throwing up, they're sick, they're just just feel horrible. Um, they have their blood pressure is high. And you start scanning and you see not a gestational sac, but this large area here of tropho trophoblastic tissues with little cystic areas. This is a high data form mole. This is what we call a molar pregnancy. The patient will have to have a DNC. They like to watch the um, HCG levels on these patients to make sure they get to zero. Here is another high data form mole. You can see um, it just with lots of area. I would say lots of hypochoic area and some cystic areas too. I would say more than likely, I usually see this form of high data form the most unless it's a partial mole. A partial mole looks more like this where you're gonna have gestational sac here. You're going to have large, gross, almost like tumor looking thing within the gestational sac. And that's part of the mole, molar pregnancy. Sometimes you will see a fetus that is also accompanied with this. They are usually viable for a little bit, but I feel like around eight weeks gestation is when they, um, a fetal demise occurs, usually in the first trimester. I don't think they usually make it past the first trimesters. And there's some vascular flow on it. So the appearance of first trimester molar pregnancy may simulate missed abortion, incomplete abortion, blighted ovum, or hydropic degeneration of placenta associated with missed abortion. So those would be your other things that you would consider. However, this right here is such a um, significant char characteristic of this um, type of pregnancy that I would be very, um, very confident to say that that is a molar pregnancy.
so this is showing a coexisting fetus with a high data form mole. The color Doppler of the molar pregnancy shows high velocity flow throughout the abnormal tissue. Um, but yeah, sometimes a fetus will be also involved with this. On transvaginal sonography, abnormal appearing choreodecidual or trophoblastic reaction consists of distorted sac shape, thin weakly echogenic or regular choreodecidual reaction, absence of double decidual sac, and mean sac diameter exceeds 10 millimeters. Usually no sign of viable embryo or early developing placenta exhibits multiple abnormal trophoblastic changes. So the sonographic examination may reveal uterus larger than dates filled with heterogeneous complex pattern, bilateral adnexal fullness. Um, there might be what we call theca luteal cysts. You guys remember those from um, first trim or OB1. Um, and those are stimulated by high levels of HCG. So since patients with molar pregnancies seem to have a very, very, very high HCG, um, it seems to um, stimulate the thecaludian cyst to develop. So they might have multiple cysts on their ovaries too. So a partial mole on sonography has identifiable, identifiable placenta and placental tissue grossly enlarged and engorged with cystic spaces. The embryo or embryonic tissue may be identified, and often the embryo is abnormal and aborted in the first trimester. In um, later stages of pregnancy greater than 12 weeks, it's a known partial molar pregnancy. Um, you need to look for structural defects because of this baby is triplody and not of a normal karyotype. They're probably going to have multiple um, anomalies. Now, unfortunately, which um, when I first started teaching, I was pregnant with my, um, gosh, second, I don't know. I've been teaching for a while, but I found out while I was pregnant and concerned and anxious about everything and teaching this crazy stuff that no, not only can you um, just have all this bad stuff that happens, but you can have malignant forms of the trophoblastic disease. Yes, you could get cancer while you're pregnant which made me very, very concerned <laughs> because of course I feel like you are a um, hypochondriac when you're learning all this stuff and you're pregnant. So um, yes, there are malignant forms of troph trophoblastic disease um, that include invasive mole and choriocarcinoma. So the cancer develops when you become pregnant, the molar, this invasive mole invades the placental or the uterine tissue and um, it loves to metastasize. So invasive my hydatiform mole occurs when hydropic villi of partial or incomplete or complete mole invades uterine myometra and may further penetrate the uterine wall. Um, clinically, the patient presents with usually heavy bleeding and very elevated HCG levels. And you're gonna have that crepe, grape like cluster throughout. So the choriocarcinoma, the malignant form of the trophoblastic disease occurs in two to 3% of molar pregnancies. And the tumor is very fast growing and it usually metastasizes to the lungs, liver, and brain. Uh, the clinical symptoms are vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain, neurological symptoms for having a tumor in your brain, and depending on where the metastasis spreads. Now, this is one of the reasons why a doctor likes to follow the HCG levels down to zero with these patients that have molar pregnancy, because if they don't go down, the HCG levels don't go down in the back of their heads, you know, it could be thinking that we need to watch out for this choriocarcinoma, this malignant form of this trophoblastic disease. So we like to watch it go down all the way down to zero, and they don't like a patient to get pregnant for three to four months after um, they've had one of these molar pregnancies, maybe six months actually now. So abnormal or absent cardiac activity. Um, so identifying the IUP with or without cardiac activity is first conclusive sign of viability. So seeing a fetal pull gives you a little bit of hope that everything's gonna be okay with this baby. 
With transvaginal sonography, living embryos should be detected by 46 menstrual days, um, about five weeks, and more than one sonogram may be necessary to establish normal pregnancy. Absence of cardiac activity in the first trimester is most critical sign for viability of pregnancy. So the heart tube forms between three and a half to five weeks of conception. And if the embryo is visible by cyanography and cardiac activity is not, um, prognosis is poor. So they kind of almost simultaneously go together. However, I have seen that there be, we scan a baby and um, the field pull is at five weeks and you can't quite see heart rate. And that's okay um, because really um, heart activity doesn't start till five and a half weeks. Now, if you see a fetal pull and they're measuring six and a half weeks and there's no fetal cardiac activity, that's a very poor prognosis. So with transvaginal ultrasound, um, when the crown rump length, which is measurement from the top of the head to the booty of the baby, measures four millimeters, the embryo should demonstrate cardiac function. Generally, if any doubt exists in measurement, patient re-examine in several days to look for cardiac activity. After seven weeks, the yolk sac and gestational sac diverge from one another and images should be made with highest possible transducer frequency to image the greatest accuracy. Transducers should be very carefully swept through the gestational to image the embryo, cardiac motion, and yolk sac. And once cardiac activity is seen, MOs should be used to record the actual heart rate. So a couple of things, um, let's say you have a baby um, seven weeks gestation, they're measuring seven weeks, yet you don't see cardiac activity. What I usually like to do is I still like to document that there's no cardiac activity. So I do that two ways. I put color Doppler on and if there's no color going through the heart, that's a great way. And I take a cine clip, I take a clip of that to document that for the doctor. Then I do an M mode. And with the M mode, um, it's gentler, I guess is a good word to say than a pulse wave Doppler. It doesn't give out as heavy of ultrasound. So that's why we like to use it on the first trimester and I'll do an M mode um, and you won't see the peaks and valleys that you would when the heart is beating. So the new criteria states that the pregnancy failure is diagnosed at a crown rump length of seven millimeters without cardiac function. So this is what I say by M mode, and this is a viable fetus. And these are the little peaks. And depending on what machine you have is how many of these peaks that you're going to measure between. Now, this one is just um, a one cycle. The ones at your school, they're gonna be two cycles. So you're gonna measure one hump here, then you go to the one, Two, and you're going to measure right there, and that should give you your heart rate. Here is a, another little thing of it. So this is the M mode. It's like a pulse wave, so you kind of do it the same way, but it's your M mode. You put it where the heart rate is. You put it on a fetal heart, and then you're going to see the M mode screen. So you're going to measure from valley to valley or from hump peak to peak. It doesn't matter as long as you are consistent. This is an absent heart rate. This patient, this sonographer did it with pulse wave um, to show that there is no cardiac activity. And you need to do that. I've gotten yelled at from a radiologist when I was in school that I did not do that. And so it's burned into my head to always document that there is no fetal heart tones. So I'm just saying, I'm just helping you not get yelled at. <laughs> So embryonic cardiac rates of less than 90 beats per minute at any gestational age within the first trimester is usually a poor prognosis. So let's say you see a little fetal heart and you put M mode on it and it's at 80. I'm like, ugh, 80 beats per minute. And that's not very good. And so that usually gives a poor prognosis. Usually around 90 is where you really want to see it, at least when it starts beating. Fetuses with heart rate of greater than 170 beats per minute show signs of tachycardia, which may lead to heart failure and fetal high drops. However, I do have to say that I have seen um, a lot of first trimester pregnancies and I've seen the heart rates get up to 180 and 186. 
to 186 and it um, turned out just fine. So those heart rates around eight to 10 weeks gestation just fly. They fly until um, the second trimester and then they slow down. So if you do get a eight to 10 weeker with a heart rate of 180, it's not always abnormal. Now in the second and third trimester, we wanna keep the heart rate between 120 and 160. So growth delay in oligohydramnios within the first trimester has poor outcomes. So if a gestational sac is five millimeters less than the crown rump length, the embryonic oligohydramnios may be suspected and the my is highly probable. So if you see like there's a very, very small sac with a larger embryo, it's usually not a good sign. The embryonic growth restriction can be determined only by relative sonographic dating, so doing more than one. So either by reliable menstrual history or growth delay of embryo or gestational sac in relation to serial sonograms. So a patient comes in, they say that they swear they're seven weeks and the embryo is measuring five weeks. They won't, but there's still a heart rate. They will go ahead and do another ultrasound within a week to see if the baby is growing correctly and the dates are just off. Now, if the patient comes back within the week, still five weeks, that's, and there's still a heart rate, that's just poor prognosis. Um, usually the fetus will spontaneously abort. And that's because of chromosome abnormalities, mostly because of triplody. So there's the little yolk sac and we want to see the yolk sac. It's the first thing to develop after the gestational sac. Um, you want to see the yolk sac also grow about 0.3 millimeters a day. Um, and you want a normal yolk sac to have a max diameter of 5.5 millimeters between five to 10 weeks. And a large yolk sac has a higher risk for spontaneous pregnancy loss and chromosome abnormalities. If the yolk sac is too large, it usually means there's something wrong with the fetus. Well, that's just what I said. If yolk sac abnormal in appearance, too large for gestational age, misshapen or highly oligogenic, patient should be watched for early pregnancy failure. Um, if cardiac activity is present, pregnancy should be followed carefully with ultrasound.